It is incredibly uncommon for a child to be abducted by strangers in the United States. Most abductions happen mostly by family members, and Robert Lowry, the vice president of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, said, quote, It doesn't happen very often, but there's certainly the cases that capture our attention because they stroke at our worst fears, end quote. Today we are going to be looking at the case of Steven Steiner, a seven-year-old boy who was abducted in 1972. And before we jump into our case, don't forget to hit that subscription button down below so you could be alerted every single time I post a new true crime case. Steven Steiner was born April 18, 1965 in Merced, California. His parents were Delbert and Kay, and he also had three sisters and an older brother named Carrie, who was later sentenced to death for committing four murders in 1999. On December 4th, 1972, Stephen was walking home from school in the afternoon. He was approached by Irvin Edward Murphy, who worked as a janitor at the Yosemite National Park in the Lodges. Irvin was posing as an aspiring minister near Stephen's school, and he was handing out gospel tracts to the boys walking home. Irvin approached Stephen and asked him if his mother would be interested in donating any items to the church. Stephen said yes, so Irvin offered him a ride to his house to pick up the items. Stephen willingly got into the car with Irvin, and a man named Kenneth Parnell was driving. Irvin and Kenneth were co-workers at the National Park together, and Kenneth at this point was a convicted child sex offender and a robber, so he convinced Irvin to work with him so he could help him abduct a child, and this was a little bit easier for Kenneth because Irvin was doing like some of the dirty work by actually approaching kids on the street, and all Kenneth had to do was drive away and take him to his house, right? So this was a little bit tricky for Irvin. He had to be the one to approach uh, these young boys. And later on, he would tell the courts that he wanted, uh, Kenneth, he wanted to raise a child in a religious type of way. Kenneth drove Stephen to a cabin near Kathy's Valley, which would be about 35 minutes drive from Merced. Stephen was confused, and because he was so young, he didn't even realize that this cabin was only a few hundred feet from his grandfather's home. Kenneth began the sexual assault on Stephen's first night at the cabin, and it escalated 13 days later to rape on December 17th. Stephen would often tell Kenneth that he wanted to leave, but he began telling the young boy that his parents signed over custody to him because they could not afford to take care of him anymore. Kenneth began calling him Dennis Gregory Parnell. He maintained Stephen's middle name and real birthday when he enrolled him into many different schools over the next few years. It is quite common in stranger abductions that the child will be renamed, but it is very uncommon for the child to still go to school. Kenneth would often act as if he was Stephen's father, and they moved around California several times and even in living in Santa Rosa for a while. Kenneth would also allow Stephen to drink at a young age and come and go as he pleased. Kenneth moved around from job to job rather frequently, and he would often travel with these jobs or work overnight shifts and leave Stephen alone for very long periods of time. And later on, Stephen would say he regretted not taking this opportunity to flee, but he said at that young age that he didn't know who to ask for help or who he could trust. So, you know, Stephen was left alone all the time, but he just didn't know what to do. And I would imagine that Stephen was absolutely terrified to leave and ask for help because the last time he spoke with a stranger, he was abducted. And so he was probably very afraid to go on and ask anyone else for help that his situation would get worse than it already was. Stephen received a dog from Kenneth that he named Queenie. This was a great source of happiness for him during this time. And the dog was originally given to Kenneth by his mother, who was not aware that her son had abducted a child. Almost two years later, Kenneth began a relationship with a woman named Barbara Mathias, and she began to live with him and Stephen. On nine separate occasions, she and Kenneth would sexually assault Stephen, and in 1975, Barbara attempted to lure another young boy for Kenneth, but was unsuccessful. Barbara later claimed that she was not aware that Stephen, or Dennis as she knew him, was kidnapped by Kenneth. As years went on, Kenneth was feeling his attraction to Stephen was waning, and he wanted to find another young boy. He asked Stephen to kidnap them for him, 
but all of the attempts were unsuccessful. Stephen would later say that he intentionally sabotaged these attempts because he felt bad for these boys. Kenneth then enlisted a friend of Stephen named Randall Sean Poorman to help him pick up a boy. On February 14, 1980, the two kidnapped Timothy White and Ukiah. Timothy was only five years old and was very distressed by the kidnapping. So about two weeks later, on March 1st, Kenneth was working a midnight shift at his security job. So Stephen and Timothy hitchhiked all the way back to Ukiah, but Timothy didn't know how to find his way home. Stephen sent Timothy into a police station alone to ask for help, but the police ended up detaining both boys. Stephen then identified himself and his story to the police, and on March 2nd, Kenneth was arrested early in the morning. When police did a background check on Kenneth, they found his sexual assault case from 1951. Both Stephen and Timothy were returned to their families that day. During Kenneth's trials, he was not charged with sexual assault because they occurred outside of the jurisdiction of the Merced County Prosecutor, and they were over the time of the Statue of Limitations. Kenneth was convicted for kidnapping and was sentenced to only seven years, and he paroled after only five years. Irvin was also tried but received no jail time because he claimed that he was under the influence of Kevin, and Stephen later said that he felt like the same as Irvin during the time Kenneth kidnapped Timothy. Stephen would say that Irvin was like an uncle to him those first few months that he lived at Kenneth's home. Barbara and Randall were also tried, but neither were arrested. Stephen's case caused California lawmakers to change state laws to allow consecutive prison terms in similar abduction cases. Stephen struggled while he was adjusting to living back home with his family. He was so used to being able to drink and come and go as he pleased that he really had a hard time connecting with his family and following rules. He said in an interview, quote, I returned almost a grown man, and yet my parents saw me at first as their seven-year-old. After they stopped trying to teach me the fundamentals all over again, it got better. But why doesn't my dad hug me anymore? Everything has changed. Sometimes I blame myself. I don't know sometimes if I should have come home. Would I have been better off if I didn't? End quote. Stephen attended counseling for a short time, but decided to quit because he did not want to disclose the details about the sexual abuse he had endured while he was with Kenneth. His sister later said that Stephen's father said that he did not need counseling, so it appears that he was not encouraged to receive the help he needed. Stephen was bullied by the other students in school for being molested, and he ended up dropping out. He began to drink heavily and was kicked out of his family home, and he maintained a bad relationship with his father for the rest of his life. And in around 1985, Stephen started to piece his life back together, and he married a woman named Jody Edmondson, and the couple had two children. He worked with a child abduction group and spoke to children at schools about personal safety. He attempted to find God and joined the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Meanwhile, he worked at a pizza shop in Merced. On September 16, 1989, Stephen was killed while riding a motorcycle with no helmet on the way home from work. The accident was a hit and run, but the driver was later identified by witnesses as Antonio Loera. He only received three months in prison. 500 people would attend Stephen's funeral, and at the time, Timothy White was 14 years old, and he was a pallbearer for Stephen. In 2004, Kenneth, who was 72 at the time, was convicted of trying to persuade his nurse to kidnap a young boy for him for $500. The nurse was aware of Kenneth's crimes and reported him to the police. Timothy White was subpoenaed to testify at Kenneth's trial, and although Stephen had passed away, his testimony at his trial was read to the jurors. Kenneth died of natural causes on January 1st, 2008, while serving 25 years to life. Timothy became a Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department deputy, and he passed away on April 1st, 2010, at age 35 from a pulmonary embolism. He was married with two children. So what do you all think of this case? I feel really bad for Stephen and Timothy, of course, because they just endured so much, especially Stephen. He was there for so long, and to grow up in that environment, and then as you're getting older, this person has less interest in you, so they want you to help them partake in kidnapping and hurting and 
sexual assaulting a child. I just find that so sad and scary. And I also just feel so bad for Stephen that he ended up passing away right when he was starting to get his life together. So I just feel really bad for him and his family because he really did seem like he was a good person. And he was definitely a hero for helping Timothy. And I know at his case, he said he felt like Irvin where he was kind to Stephen, that's what he said, and probably anything felt like kindness compared to what Kenneth was doing, but I do really feel like it was completely different what Stephen did. Stephen, you know, risked his own life and risked his own well-being to help Timothy and help him find his way home, and he was going to just allow Timothy to walk into that police department without trying to help himself. So I do feel like he was definitely a hero, and I feel so bad for him that he ended up passing away from, you know, his accident. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you liked it, please hit the like button down below and let me know what other cases you guys would like me to cover. I've been getting some really good ideas from you guys in the comments. So, you know, let me know what you guys are interested in. Feel free to always leave me a comment down below. Um, follow me on TikTok. I'll put that down below. I do shorter cases on there, just quick ones. And also follow me on Instagram. I do post some true crime stuff. Um, and I know some of you have been interested as to what like my living room looks like asking me if it's always like Halloween decorated So I do have pictures of that as well if you guys are interested in that type of thing or just to connect and let's chat uh, Things like that. I'm always interested in getting to know you guys So feel free to leave all that down below in the comments and I will see you guys next time. Have a great day and stay safe out there. Bye. -bye.